Hello, this is John Milburn for Laws 11059. This is Statutory Interpretation. We're into week five. And this week we're dealing with in, intention and, and interpretive techniques. I know that's difficult, a bit of a mouthful, but the intention is something we've talked about earlier. But now we get into some of the techniques that you need to use to properly interpret legislation. And um, the reading material is chapter five of your text in, in Sanson. I'm just going to digress. I've mentioned a couple of times the issue of um, legal research and the importance of considering uh, legal research more broadly. I'm going to share the video with you um, to a screen and hopefully this will succeed. So with luck, you're now viewing some extracts from Ostley. This is the Australian Legal Information Institute, Ostley, very popular service for considering legislation generally and um, related materials. But whilst most people use Ostley for access to legislation, there is a lot more to it. So please go to the index, have a look at the uh, user guide, which uh, I've got here in part. You'll see that there's a great deal of information relevant to you. And um, please consider the contents of the user guide. It provides valuable information about browsing the databases. Legislative databases provide you with uh, ability to search a whole range of issues. Note up, um, which is third down on the, the list, list there on the left is particularly useful section. Case law databases are particularly useful as well. And it provides you with information about how to search the database, the connectors that are used um, to assist you in searching, in search, sorry, searches and provide you with um, info, information about frequency. Law site, you'll see um, in the middle of the page there, is a very valuable legal citation service and I commend it to you. There are a number of citation services available in different platforms. This is just the one used at Ostley. And um, I do urge you to consider to improve your skills by considering the advanced search technique using search options and um, searching databases. So LawSight through Ostley has a great deal to offer and uh, I urge you to consider that and also other legal citators that are available to you. So when it comes to interpreting legislation, We've already raised a number of issues and the importance of identifying relevant statute and case law for um, those purposes. There are a number of general principles that apply for the interpretation of legislation and the meaning of the text may require you to consider the context, which means considering that which is around the legislation You'll need to consider the general purpose. You'll need to consider issues around policy. And ultimately, if you're looking at the intention of Parliament, I guess you could consider the mischief that Parliament is trying to remedy. Now, that may be trying to implement some policies promised at an election, maybe seeking to overturn a decision of a court that was um, unfavourable as far as Parliament is concerned. There might be a range of things, but... When we talk about the mischief that legislation is designed to overcome, we're really talking about, well, why is this legislation being introduced? And um, what's wrong that requires something to be put right? What's the mischief that we're trying to fix here? Project Blue Sky is always a go-to case in this area of practice. So have a look at paragraph 69 where in that case, the court said ordinarily the meaning, the legal meaning, will correspond with the grammatical meaning, but that's not always true. And I referred you to that passage last week. And context and purpose, as we discussed last week, is important because it means that we have an opportunity to determine the legal meaning, and that sometime is different to the ordinary or grammatical meaning. And to determine the legal meaning, we need to consider the context but we need to do so within the general purpose and the policy provisions, and it needs to be undertaken in a way that's fair and consistent with the way in which legal drafters of courts deal with these issues. We talked about that last week as well. 
So you need to consider the legal meaning of a, of a section or a word or a phrase or even a, a part of a section um, by reference to the language of the section or of the act as a whole. And we, we hear that term a lot in statutory interpretation. You need to consider something viewed as a whole is a handy thing to, to remember and use. So in Project Blue Sky, the court went on to say at 70 and 71, that a legislative instrument must be construed on the prima facie basis that its provisions are intended to give effect to harmonious goals. And that's a key issue because what we're really trying to do in determining the intention in using these interpretive techniques, we're looking to come up with an answer that gives effects, effect to the harmonious goals of the legislation. Now, where there's a conflict that appears to arise from the language of the particular provisions, of course, we need to alleviate the conflict by adjusting the meaning of the competing provisions to achieve a result that best gives effect to the purpose and language of those provisions and this is all part of paragraph 70 and 71 of Project Blue Sky, while maintaining the unity of all of those statutory provisions. So we're reconciling conflicting provisions, which means that the court will need to consider the leading provision and then determine which are the subordinate provisions. So an important statutory interpretive technique is to understand the difference between lead provisions and subordinate provisions. And therefore, determine which one gives way to the other. And uh, therefore, we need to understand that in interpreting legislation, there is a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of provisions and each case requires us to consider how to best interpret the legislation as a whole, partly by reference to the hierarchy of the provisions. Now, obviously, in interpreting legislation, we try to consider every word that's there it's not always possible, but that's what we aim to do. So when we're talking about the purpose, as we discussed last week, firstly, you look at any express statements, then look at any inferences that can be drawn from the material, and then we consider extrinsic materials, probably in that order. But the starting point then is to consider what the Act seeks to achieve as a whole, and then determine whether what you believe the Act is trying to achieve within that part fits within that greater, um, more dominant um, interpretive technique provision. So a fundamental provision of statutory interpretation uh, is to consider the objective approach. And Project Blue Sky said, and this is at 78, the duty of a court is to give the words of a statutory provision the meaning that the legislature is taken to have intended them to have. And that's an important aspect of legislative intent. Now, there are some general rules, for example, um, against retrospective operation of um, legislation. I'll refer you to a decision of Queensland um, Court of Appeal. It's RV PAZ, P A Z, it's an acronym. It's 2017 QCA 263. And it dealt with the issue of whether a particular trial in a district court trial uh, matter criminal proceeding was flawed because legislation had changed between the date of the alleged offences and the date of the trial. And the question was, was the prosecution fairly advanced, uh, given that there'd been a change in the law at, at the time uh, when the person was originally charged? So it, it was a, you don't need to worry too much about the case, the, the reasons, sorry, the, um, the facts of the case. But essentially, one of the provisions was this. And you, from this, you can probably determine what the case was about. But in late 2016, the Health and Other Legislation Amendment Act 2016 um, abolished Section 208 of the Criminal Code, which provided for the offence of unlawful sodomy. And the health legislation, Section 4, was the section that achieved it. Now, part of my reason for raising this is, is twofold, really. One is to emphasize that when you're considering interpretive techniques, you need to determine the way of casting the net a little wider than might be at first obvious, because at first obvious, you read a section 
And you'd think, well, this applies. But it may not apply for two reasons, which was highlighted in this case. The first is that um, the provision may not relate to the acts as charged when they were charged and, and, and when, um, when they're committed, which can be different dates. And also, you may need to look beyond that legislation for an amendment to it. So when you're determining your flowchart of how to interpret legislation, you need to consider that other acts of parliament can sometimes change the act that you're looking at. Now, that might make it feel overwhelming. How can I possibly determine this? But if you look at the acts as they were in place at a particular time, you can see by reference to the schedule when the act was changed and how it was changed. Anyway, in this case of RVPAZ, <clears throat> what happened is that um, there was a charge in the district court about um, unlawful sexual relationship involving a 16-year-old, but the law had changed so that now, now it wasn't unlawful <coughs> in this particular instance. And there were arguments about whether that legality could stand or not at the time. So do have a look at that case in general terms. Uh, the arguments that were put forward, ultimately, the court found that there was no real doubt that the appellant was charged upon arrest. Therefore, the acts were unlawful when they were done and lawful, unlawful when charged. So this instance was um, where the law had changed between the, the dates of the final court case and the, um, the date of the acts being charged. Um, and therefore, the appeal was dismissed. But it is an interesting case in that regard. Now, when we talk about intention and interpretive techniques, amongst other things, we need to consider some well-known phrases within the context of statutory interpretation. We need to consider object, motive, intention, purpose. All of these things go towards comprising the concept of objective intention. And statutory purpose or object, if you like, focuses on why legislation is needed, which goes back to the issue of mischief that we talked about earlier, and the who it's directed towards. So the aim is to determine the purpose of the statute in question has set out to remedy and what ruling would effectively implement the remedy. Now, a case I referred you to earlier is one of those go-to cases of Lacey and the Attorney General. As a reminder, it's 2011 242 CLR. And this um, concept is well described at paragraph 44. So I'd urge you to take that paragraph and fit it within the context of the material that you're preparing. Now, just as an aside, what you should be doing at this stage is preparing all of these pieces of information in a logical manner that you can essentially borrow from your own resources to introduce into a model answer or to answer a problem around statutory interpretation. So in the final exam, you, you know, you may have a task of uh, providing a response to a legal problem based on statutory interpretation principles. And it's a bit like putting together a, a menu or a meal. You might need some of this and some of that. You might need to, to draw something there to create something that's logical, but ref refers to other sources. What I'd urge you not to do is walk into the exam cold, as it were, and not have those parcels ready to introduce as chunks of material. Uh, it'll be too difficult and you'll forget things. Whereas if you're well organized in advance, uh, you can, as it were, put together your answer relatively quickly within a short time period if you've done the legwork and you're well organized and you've got the parts that you need. So for example, the quote in Lacey at paragraph 44 is probably something that you should grab, put into your cat catalog it in a way that makes sense to you and then have it to introduce ready to go in part of an answer. And, and I'm suggesting to you that it helps to deal with the issue of the object uh, being one of the concepts of objective intention. 
Now, intention is another key word, and intention focuses on the issue of doing, as opposed to the statutory purpose or object. So intention focuses on what is done to meet the purpose and how it should be implemented. So the aim of statutory interpretation is to determine and give effect to the intention parliament as disclosed by the language of the statute, having regard to the applicable common law and the, the statutory rules of construction. We talked about that earlier. This is not a new concept. You see, this goes back to Dixon and Todd, 1904-1 CLR 320. So um, intention fits within the object, but you need to put it in a way that works for you. All right. Um, in terms of the general principles um, that apply for statutory interpretation, you need to consider purpose, but you need to make some assumptions at time. Uh, you need to look at the words that were actually used and the reason why the law was introduced. And that will give you a better idea of the context. The context can be internal, what's within the statute, or it can be external, which is by reference to outside sources. And um, if there are two constructions of a piece of legislation, then you need to make a choice. And one of the ways to do it is to consider that which is absurd or unreasonable um, in terms of a consequence. Therefore, you, you choose the other, more logical consequence. Now, what, how, do I, how do you do that in practice? Well, one of the ways that we see this in courts often is when you have two counsel, for example, arguing over the way in which a statute ought be interpreted in a particular section, you'll often see the judge or magistrate, as the case may be, um, ask counsel or solicitors questions. All right. Um, and it expands on it. It's essentially saying, all right, well, if I was to accept your interpretation argument, then what would happen if, and then you think through some examples, and what you're looking for, what the court is looking for, is to determine whether that form of construction would lead to a consequence that would become absurd or unreasonable, as opposed to the alternate argument where it's more internally consistent within a broad, broader context. So that's where we need to think about context is not just in relation to that argument, but in relation to how it might be used in a different setting so that you can get an idea of what's the better interpretation. I've mentioned a few times that you need to do this within the context of statutory interpretive techniques. You also need to consider common law uh, canons and um, doctrines. Um, and we'll talk about more of those over the next few weeks as well. And sometimes you need to consider this. Um, occasionally, words need to be read into a statute or taken out of a statute in order for it to make sense. And um, that means there's a fundamental question. Are the courts able to do that? Can they consider adding in words to give it better meaning? Or is that imposing the court's will too much into the, um, uh, to the mind of parliament? Um, but ultimately, it's a matter of determining the construction that has been determined appropriate by parliament and the legislature and it means that you need to consider the remedial approach generally to statutes. All right, um, in terms of how you go about um, further um, dealing with your studies, make sure that you've got a clear understanding of how, you, how courts will construct as a whole, how the courts will consider consistency of meaning throughout a statute, how they deal with inconsistency, and how they deal with corrections and deletions and implications. Um, sometimes there are typographical or grammatical errors. Sometimes there is a need to delete or to substitute or to introduce. And when do courts do that? 
and to what extent should they do it. But ultimately, you need to go back always to general principles and a statutory provision should be construed so it is consistent with the language and purpose of all the provisions of the statute. Its meaning must be determined by reference to the language of the statute considered as a whole. That means you need to consider the parts of the Act, do in, and consider the headings, the marginal notes, the schedules, the dictionary sections that are um, often there as well. And um, also consider the Justice Generis rule, which basically says that um, words um, that are can be interpreted in different ways should be considered within the context of a list of things uh, within that particular class of things. So, um, you know, if we were talking about um, you know, glasses within the context of optical aids, then we shouldn't interpret the word glasses as meaning a receptacle from which you um, drink. Uh, so that would be a totally different meaning. So we do look, we use the adjustum generis rule to think about the list, the type of list, uh, it's sort of like that birds of a feather flock together type concept. And that's one of the common law principles. Now, when it comes to determining the purpose, you need to identify the purpose. You should be on top of this by now as to where it is that you look. Um, and we've mentioned common law materials. That's relevant, particularly in terms of extrinsic materials, in that in order to get a better idea of the legislative history, you need to consider some of the common law approaches. We'll talk about more about this later. But one of the important cases on that regard, in that regard is um, CIC Insurance Limited against Bankstown Football Club. Um, that's an important case. Keep it in your well catalogued. It's 1997 187 CLR 384. And in that case, in the context of how materials should be used in um, relevant to the context, the court said, and this is um, at 408, it is well settled that at common law, the court may have regard to reports of law reform bodies to ascertain the mischief which a statute is intended to cure. Moreover, the modern approach to statutory interpretation insists that the context be considered in the first instance, not merely at some later stage when ambiguity might thought to arise and uses context in its widest sense to include such things as existing state of law and the mischief which by legislative means, such as those just mentioned, one may, may, one may discern the statute was intended to remedy. Instances of general words in a statute being so constrained by their context are numerous. If the apparently plain words of a provision are read in the light of the mischief, which the statute would, was designed to overcome and of the objects of the legislation, they may wear a very different appearance. Further inconvenience or improbability of result may assist the court in preferring the literal meaning and, uh, to the literal meaning and alternate construction, which by the steps identified above is reasonably open and more closely conforms to the legislative intent. So that passage neatly puts together what is the key to interpretive techniques when it comes to interpreting a statute. And um, I would recommend that you identify these things by a list and that you um, refer to some of these decisions and cases as we've mentioned. All right, so keep um, up with your reading, Put, keep putting together your notes and your bites um, ready to introduce into different answers. And we'll wrap up now with another quiz. Um, so uh, listening carefully, I'll give you a number of alternate answers and I want you to determine which is the correct answer. So the first is as follows. Which of the following jurisdictions apply to apply the interpretation that would best achieve the purpose or object of an act? And that is number one. Just bear with me a moment.
A, Commonwealth, Queensland and the ACT. B, New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia. C, the Commonwealth, New South Wales and Victoria. Or D, all Australian jurisdictions use this approach. Now, bear in mind, I use the words there, best achieved the purpose or object of an act. And as a hint, you might recall that previously I've said that when you look at the Acts Interpretation Acts, they always they, they tend to have slightly different wording in relation to those key issues. Next question. Which approach to statutory interpretation is least in restrictive? A, the best achievement approach. B, the preferred construction approach. C, a formalistic approach. And D, a literal approach. Next question. Is it necessary for there to be ambiguity in legislation before the context can be considered? Dealt with that tonight, um, or in this session rather. A, yes, B, no, C, sometimes, and D, each act should state what context may be used in its interpretation. Next question, which of the following is correct? A, context is applied first and then purpose. B, purpose is applied first and then context. And C, interpretation can be, can be contextual or purposive, but not both. It's a really interesting question because it goes to the heart of how you're putting together your notes ready to answer statutory interpretation questions. Next question. Where can the purpose of legislation be found? A, the objects clause, explanatory memorandum and long title. B, long title, parliamentary debates, media reports. Or C, objects clause, government white paper and ministerial reports. Next question. What does a court do if the purpose is not stated in the legislation? A, the court should not apply the purpose of approach unless the purpose is stated in the legislative, uh, in the relevant legislation. B, ask the relevant minister to provide a statement for the purpose. C, use legal reasoning to deduce the purpose and apply that. Or D, apply the legislation fairly notwithstanding its failure to state its purpose. Next question. What should a court do if the legislation has multiple or conflicting purposes? A, choose the one the court considers is its best purpose and apply that. B, work out which is the dominant purpose and apply that. We've talked about a lot of these terms even in this session. And the purpose of that question is for you to determine some clarity of thought so that we're not just using words, we're actually doing so in a logical manner. So that's a pretty important question. See if you can work through that. We've talked about it tonight. Um, you may have to, or in this session, you may have to, to rewind. Next, is if there is only one ordinary meaning and one purpose, the court should A, check that ordinary meaning, promotes the purpose. B, look again, it's never that simple. C, consider what parliamentary compromise took place to agree upon a single purpose. And D, choose an interpretation that achieves the purpose. The actual words used are not really important so long as the purpose is served. And the final question in this session, if someone says there's been a reservation to literalism, what do they mean? A, the courts are abandoning the mischief rule and applying the literal rule. B, there's an increased focus on the text of a provision as compared to the context or purpose. And C, there's an increased focus on context in interpreting the words that are used. All right, thank you very much. Keep up the good work, keep at it. And by now you should be getting together a really good workbook that assists you uh, logically in answering interpretation questions. We'll see you next time.